Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the introduction to Conda for data science and machine learning um, tutorial at SciPy Japan. Uh, my name is David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology's core laboratory. Um, I'm also a certified instructor with software and data carpentry. I do want to let you know that so today's tutorial is being uh, simultaneously translated into Japanese. So if you would like to have a Japanese interpretation, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, next to the Q&A, uh, there is a interpretation button and a little globe. So if you click on that, uh, you will be able to select um, Japanese uh, interpretation, and then you will get uh, a simultaneous uh, Japanese translation of today's uh, tutorial. So, okay. So before we get started, uh, just a few kind of logistics things. So today's tutorial is going to be a combination of my lecturing um, and also uh, some hands-on exercises. So the first thing I'm going to do is share a few links in the chat um, to the, the lesson materials, the tutorial materials for today, um, and then a link to the GitHub repository for those uh, materials that contains a link to the uh, compute environment that I'm going to use for the hands-on portions of, of today's training. So I'm going to share those links now in the chat. And first, I will start sharing um, uh, sharing my screen so I can show you what links I'm sharing. OK, so hopefully now everyone can see my screen. So the first link that I'm going to be sharing is a link to the teaching materials, the training materials for today. So. Here is the link to the training materials. So the training materials that I'm using today are materials that I've been developing as part of the Carpentries Incubator Program. Um, they are uh, always available. So you know, even after today, if there are bits about the training that you want to go back and uh, work through on your own, or go through again because something was unclear, you can always go back uh, to the, the teaching materials themselves. And I'll talk about you know, more what we're going to cover in just a minute after we get everyone set up. OK, the second link that I wanted to share is a link to the GitHub repository for these. The GitHub repository for these training materials is where I'm um, developing and continuing to improve and add to the training materials. Um, and any issues that you might find with these training materials or things that you think I could improve, you're more than welcome to open an issue. And uh, perhaps it's something that we can uh, work on or collaborate on going forward to improve the uh, improve these training materials. The last link that I want to share for today is the, um, the link to the compute environment that we're going to use. So in the readme file for the um, Introduction to Conda for Data Scientists repository on GitHub, there's a little button here that says Launch Binder. If you right click that and open it in a new tab, then the, um, the compute resources that I'm going to be using to teach the hands-on portions of the tutorial today will be launched on top of the global uh, Binder Hub cluster. Uh, Binder Hub is a, uh, an open source tool that leverages uh, technologies um, called Repo to Docker and uh, some other tools, Jupyter Hub, to make um, GitHub repositories available to run in the cloud for free. 
So when you're, um, um, after a few seconds, you should see a screen that looks like this. You may or may not see a dialog box that says build recommended. Um, you can just hit cancel and get rid of that dialog box. Okay, so I'm going to also put into the chat, I'm going to copy this link and also add um, that link to the chat. So this is the link to uh, the binder resources, and I'll call it you know, link to the compute resources for today's train. Okay. Okay. So at this point, I just want to pause and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm just going to give everyone a few minutes um, to, um, to ask questions if you're stuck about getting um, the compute environment running in your browser. I just want to make sure everybody has gotten the links and that they're able to um, um, open the, the, uh, the binder resources in their browser. So now would be a good time if you have um, a question or you need me to repeat something. Um, so there's a question in the link uh, from Genevieve about, can you post the link again? So which link, um, Genevieve? So there are three links and they, they should be in the chat if you scroll up to the top of the chat, I think. Ah, okay, can't scroll up. So I guess it depends on when you've joined. Um, do not get the links in the chat. Ah, okay. I will repost the links um, for people who are uh, who are just joining. I see. Okay. Um, so let's go through that process again. So I'm going to go, I'm going to repost all of the links now. Uh, and then uh, Koyama-san, uh, after I repost the links again, uh, perhaps you could, um, you know, then repost them if, if other people are, are asking for them who are joining later. Um, but I'll repost them again now. So we will get, First, we'll do the teaching materials. Then we will do the GitHub repo for the teaching materials. And finally, the link to the compute resource. Okay, so I've reposted all three links in the chat. And so hopefully um, those of you who are, are joining late um, will be able to uh, pick up those links. And then Koyama-san, if, if other people are asking about the links, if you could maybe save those uh, somewhere on your, your local machine and then just repost them as necessary. They don't, don't see anything. Oh, ha. That's an error on my part, sorry. So somehow, um, aha, yes, okay. I did. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll try this one more time. Um, so now both panelists and attendees should be receiving the link. Sorry, I, I didn't realize that normally the default setting on Zoom is to send things to everyone. Um, okay, so. Um,
third time is the charm. So here is the link to the uh, training materials. So hopefully somebody uh, who is an attendee could confirm receipt of this one now, just so I'm, I know that. Ah, excellent, hooray. Okay, and then we will do link to the, the GitHub repo. And then Okay, all right, this, we'll, we'll try this again. So now everyone should have received the three links, um, the link to the training materials. I'm just going to share my screen again. So the first link is to the training materials. So, and again, I'll just to reiterate, so these training materials are always available online. They're being developed publicly um, as part of the uh, the software and data carpentry or the carpentry's um, incubator program for lesson development. So if there's something that um, maybe I go through a little bit too quickly today and you want to come back to, um, the course materials are always online. Uh, the second link was to the GitHub repository for these materials um, where I'm developing the lessons. Again, if you have any issues or things that you think I could improve uh, in these lessons, I would be very grateful if you would open it an issue. Um, and then maybe it's something that we can collaborate together on fixing and improving these lessons for, uh, for other people who want to use them in their own, uh, own training and teaching. And then the third link is actually just the link that you will follow if you click this launch binder button, which is in the readme of the, uh, the GitHub repository. So if you right click and open this in a new tab, then after uh, hopefully not very long, maybe 30 seconds uh, or a minute, could be longer if lots of people are clicking the link uh, simultaneously. Um, but eventually you should see Jupyter Lab running in your browser. And if you get a little dialogue box like this, sometimes I, I've gotten this today as I've been um, testing out these teaching materials, sometimes not, but if you do get it, you can just hit uh, cancel. Okay. So I'm just going to, again, stop sharing. I want to make sure that everybody is, is, uh, is with me. So as long as you have the link to the teaching materials today, so you can follow along and you have compute resources running, so you can do the hands-on exercise, then we should be good to go. Um, so I just want to check that how we're doing with that. So at the bottom of of Zoom, there's a little participants um, button. And oh, there isn't a. Oh, I guess maybe because I'm not the host. Well, that's okay. I, I was just going to make sure that I was going to take a little quick poll, but we'll just have to. Um, all right, okay. Well, okay, so you just have to respond in chat. So we have about 15. So if, if those of you who are, are participating in the training today, if you could just um, respond yes in the chat, if you've been able to get, um, if you've been able to get Jupyter Lab running in the browser, like you see here um, on my machine, um, just so I can make sure that, uh, that we can do some hands-on participation and interaction. Excellent, lots of yeses. <clears throat> okay, okay, good. So I'm not seeing any no's. So I'll go ahead and, um, and we'll get started with the, uh, with the teaching now. Ah, so one thing I should mention about the Jupyter Lab is, so there is a timeout mechanism. It's about 20 or 30 minutes. So if, if 
if you were to fall asleep or you were to not interact with your uh, your browser window at all, then um, uh, Binder Hub would think that you are you're done using this uh, computing uh, resource and it will clean it up and then take it away. Um, if that happens to you, then all you need to do is go back and uh, click the binder button or um, click the link again that I, I shared with you via chat and you'll get a new fresh compute instance um, and all will be well again. Um, but you will lose um, you will lose uh, any work that you've done up until that point. So these are kind of ephemeral compute resources that are useful for teaching. Um, but they're not persistent, so you will lose any um, any work that you've been doing at that point. So if you want to keep it active, then all you need to do is you know any any kind of clicking or interaction with the the browser window is enough to uh, to keep the resources from timing out. Okay. Um, okay. So the schedule of events for today. So we will cover as, as much of this as we can uh, in the three and a half hour uh, session that we have today. Um, we may not be able to cover, uh, to cover all of it, um, but as I said, you know, the, the training materials are here, so you can go through, uh, go through the parts that we don't cover um, on your own. Um, we're going to start with a, a kind of the first episode, which is getting started with Conda, is just a quick motivation for um, for the Conda tool, you know what is it, and um, what problems does it solve, and you know why should you you know pay attention to the rest of the training that I'm going to give, and then the the second episode, working with environments, is kind of one of the um, the three major uh, major content episodes uh, for the training. So it's going to cover all of the basics of working with Conda and using Conda to. Uh, solve your package and environment management problems. And then we're going to move on to talking about how you can share these environments with your with your colleagues, uh, your research peers, um, anyone with whom you would like to uh, share an environment with. Um, then there is a, uh, a slightly more technical training uh, episode on using packages and channels, which is more of a deep dive into uh, Conda channels and Conda packages. Um, and then finally, there is an episode on how to use Conda to manage your, um, your GPU dependencies. So as um, increasingly uh, data science and machine learning workloads are being accelerated with um, GPUs, typically though not always NVIDIA uh, GPUs, um, GPUs in, uh, increase the complexity of uh, software installation and add kind of another, another layer of software that you need to manage. And Conda is really great for helping you manage the uh, additional complexities of working with GPUs. Uh, so I will probably end today's discussion And if I need to skip the packages and channels episode in order to make sure that I discuss GPU dependencies, then I will probably do that. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started with Conda. Um, ah, so I guess one other logistical thing. So I will try to take um, three breaks, I think. So we have a three and a half hour session. I will try to take uh, to break it up into four parts. So I'll take a, a maybe a slightly longer break about halfway through and then in the middle of the first section, you know, so after about 30 or 40 minutes, I'll take a, a short break. And then um, in the middle of the second session, I'll also try to take a short, a short break. And if you have questions, um, please try to ask them in the chat and um, either myself or uh, Koyama-san who is helping me today will try to answer uh, any questions that uh, that you might have. And then I will, um, but you should also feel free if you would like to interrupt um, and ask a question. Um, I am more than happy to entertain uh, interruptions for topical questions. Okay. Are there any questions before we, before I get rolling with the, with the teaching? No? Okay. Wow. 
Well, let's get started then. Okay, so in this first episode, I'm going to kind of motivate the, the problem that data science and uh, machine learning uh, researchers and practitioners face um, when kind of starting or, or doing any data science or machine learning project. And then I'm gonna talk about how Conda solves that particular problem. So we're gonna uh, you know, answer the question, what is Conda? Um, and then answer you know, the questions about why you should use some tool to manage the complexities of package and environment management um, as part of your research workflow. And then I'll particularly point out why I think Conda and particularly Conda plus PIP um, is the, the right way to answer or the, the right way to solve these problems. Okay, so what is Conda? So Conda is an open source package and environment management system that runs across the major operating systems. So it will work on Windows, Mac, uh, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, Conda can be used to uh, install and update packages and dependencies. And that can also be used to uh, create, save, load, and switch between project environments on your computer. So it's going to solve two problems that uh, machine learning and data science practitioners face. The first problem is package management. Uh, and the second problem is environment management. So whenever you start a new project, you're going to want to keep your, um, your software for that project separate from the other software that you might have installed on your computer and the other software that you might have installed for other projects that you're working on. And so those are creating different software environments for your different projects and keeping them isolated from one another can be tricky and Conda um, provides a solution to help you manage that complexity. And then within each environment, you need to install packages, not just Python, but maybe scikit-learn or PyTorch or TensorFlow or NVIDIA Rapids or Pandas. Um, you know, these are common packages that are used by data scientists and machine learning practitioners, and you might need different versions of those within each of your projects and within each of your environments. And their uh, Conda will also solve that problem. It will manage the uh, package installation process for you. Okay, so there's quite a bit of confusion um, when I have taught this course in the past and, and also um, I think online, you know, if you were to just kind of dive in and start re doing your own research on um, on uh, how to use Conda, you'll encounter Conda and Mini Conda and Anaconda, and it can be a bit confusing about what exactly is what. And so I think this is a nice kind of a nested uh, Venn diagram that kind of explains how these three um, uh, three entities kind of exist within one another. So Conda, the inner circle here, is a, um, is a package and environment management tool that we're going to use from the command line. Conda itself it works across Windows, Mac, or Linux, but in order to do that, it needs um, some additional things. So first, it's going to need its own version of Python that is different and isolated from your system's version of Python. So um, you may, may or may not have noticed that Python is installed pretty much on every computer by default. Um, and that's because operating system um, vendors, you know, Windows or Mac or Linux use Python in order to manage the operating system. And they manage the, the system Python and the things that the system Python needs to function. You generally don't want to use the system Python as a data science or machine learning practitioner because if you accidentally corrupt the system Python, that can have negative impacts on your overall, um, on your computer itself. So the mini Conda distribution provides the Conda tool, but also an additional uh, installation of Python that the Conda tool will use to interact with your operating system. In order to interact with the different operating systems, it needs some different packages that are specific to Windows, Mac, or Linux. And that is what you get with the mini Conda distribution. So you get the Conda tool, but you also get a separate version of Python, as well as some base packages that are operating system specific. Then you have the Anaconda Python distribution. 
Um, and the Anaconda Python distribution is, uh, again, an, you know, an open source distribution of Python that kind of contains not just many conda, but like 200 um, to 300 packages that are kind of widely used and, um, and very popular within the data science, machine learning, scientific computing sub ecosystem of the Python world. Um, I encourage you to install Miniconda um, because it's a little bit smaller and kind of simpler to get started and um, not to install the full Anaconda distribution. But if you have um, on your local machine. So today we don't have to bother with installing other Miniconda or Anaconda because I have created the software environment for you that we're going to use today inside of uh, Binder, inside of uh, uh, the Binder Hub. I'll just check on my binder hub and interact with it a little bit just to make sure that it's not um, not going to time out on me. Okay. Oh, and I should mention that if you want to install, I'm going to copy this link address. So if you want to install um, con or mini conda locally on your system, then there is a set of instructions on how to do that. So I'm putting the link for setup instructions for a local uh, Miniconda installation. So if you follow that link, there will be instructions on um, to how to install Miniconda locally so that you can do everything that we're going to do today um, on your local computer uh, or your local machine. Okay. Okay, so now that was the answer to the question of what is Conda. And so next I wanna cover, you know, basically why you should use a package environment management system. Okay, so one of the, the major problems when I was getting started with data science and machine learning and scientific computing in general that, um, that I ran into is that um, installing software is really difficult. It's a challenge. Um, I think anybody who has um, you know, even just begun to um, get started in machine learning or data science or maybe even just computing in general and start to have to install software themselves realizes what a difficult and kind of challenging and confusing process uh, software installation can be. This is particularly true of scientific software, um, largely in part because soft, scientific software is often written by, um, by, by scientists and researchers and um, you know, people for whom software engineering is not their primary profession. And so, you know, you get some, some software that, that works for them and that solves their that helps them answer their scientific research questions. Um, but you know, making it um, an easy and, pa and painless installation for other people might not be their primary um, primary goal or, or, or effort. So it can be really challenging to install scientific software. Um, <clears throat> because of these challenges in the past, it was it was often installing software on a single machine system-wide was, was the way that software installation worked. That was like the primary, uh, primary way of installing software. So you, but this is uh, problematic for um, kind of modern scientific and data science and machine learning workflows because when you install everything on your computer, all of a sudden, you have, it's really hard to figure out exactly what software is required for a particular research project. There's no isolation between projects. There's no ability to say, you know, this list of software is what I'm using on project A and this other list of software is what I'm using on project B. For example, if everything is installed on your system, then effectively your entire computer is required to uh, reproduce your work on all of your projects, which is, is makes it challenging. Um, 
it's also very difficult to install different versions of the same software package at the same time. So um, it is almost always the case if you have many different projects that some projects, maybe projects that you started six months ago, need older versions of software that than what you would want to use for projects that you're starting today. And this is true simply because of the rapid pace at which uh, data science, machine learning, and scientific software is developed. You know, there are new versions being released on a you know, semi-monthly basis. And, um, and you know, newer versions might not work with software required for older projects. So you need to be able to install different versions of software on the same machine at the same time. And if you install things system-wide, you know, if you update software for one of your projects, that might break your software environment for your other, for another project. And this is, is really, really annoying. Probably the most um, uh, fundamental problem with uh, installing software system-wide is updating it will break software for, for some other projects. So, I guess another way to put this is that when you install software system-wide, it creates all of these interdependencies between your projects that really shouldn't exist. And so what we're going to learn, what you're going to learn today with Conda is a way to install software individually for your different projects in a way that keeps everything separate from one another and removes these uh, dependencies between your software stacks. Okay. So uh, the next sections here on um, you know, environment management and package management go into, I think, more, uh, more detail um, behind the, the high level explanation of, um, of what Conda does um, that I think is worth covering. Um, so I want to kind of get to the hands, more hands-on portions of, of today's training. So I'll kind of leave these details there for you uh, to go through kind of on your own. And we're going to uh, try to get to the, um, get through to the hands-on section. So to kind of wrap up this little introduction. So, you know, why should you use Conda and PIP to solve these package and environment management problems? So, um, a major, so there are kind of three, uh, three major reasons that I, I want to focus on. So, you know, there's this environment management, uh, problem, which I talked about, and then the package management problem, um, where you need to install the actually installing the various versions of the software within each individual project and Conda solves both of these problems. So, um, so most other um, tools that target this, uh, this problem set use typically two tools, one for environment management and another tool for package management. And both problems in one um, relatively easy to use tool. Um, also Conda distributes, um, distributes pre-built packages uh, or binaries, and this this is particularly uh, makes Conda particularly well suited for uh, data science, machine learning, and scientific computing use cases where software often needs to be compiled in order to achieve optimal performance. And therefore, um, if you wanted to install the software locally without Conda, you yourself might need to compile and build all of this software and make sure that it works properly together. And that is, is very challenging. So Conda kind of circumvents all of that by making sure that the, the pre-compiled binaries are distributed uh, via Conda in a way that they will just work together without you having to build things. And again, I mentioned uh, Conda being cross-platform, works on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, and this is really useful for um, environment reproducibility. So the, uh, uh, the ability to um, you know, specify your Conda environment in a way that someone who wanted to rep uh, reproduce your, your workflow, whether it was you know, if you're a practitioner in industry and you have uh, your work colleagues 
uh, who need to reproduce your work or reproduce your software environment, um, it kind of will make it a lot easier for them to do that. And if you're a researcher um, in you know, machine learning or data science, then your, your research is more reproducible because you'll have an environment that others can um, build to replicate your work. Um, and Conda also in, interacts well with the default kind of package manager in the Python community, which is called PIP. And we'll see some examples, uh, uh, examples of that. Um, okay, so just to kind of wrap up this introductory session. Um, so again, Conda is a platform agnostic open source package environment management system. Um, Adopting a tool like Conda for solving the package environment management uh, problems facilitates the kind of portability and reproducibility of your of your workflows. Um, and Conda in PIP will solve uh, Conda plus PIP. So that's kind of uh, using Conda as your primary tool and then using PIP uh, where necessary. Again, I'll, we'll show examples of, of that in the hands on session um, solves both the package and environment management problems and allows you to target multiple programming languages, not just Python. Um, and that differentiates Conda from these other tools that either target one uh, or the other, or target only a particular uh, programming language. Okay, so before we move on to the next section, I just wanna see if there are any questions, um, I'll stop sharing for a minute, if there are any questions about the, um, about kind of the basics of Conda about what is Conda, not how to use it. We'll, we'll, um, um, we'll get to how to use Conda in the next session. David. Yes. Th there is a qu one question. Uh, is, it, is it possible to upgrade a package for for, 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 for one package. Ah. So, yes. Oh, sorry, was that the end of the question? Ah, sorry, maybe my translation is not uh, enough. Uh, is it possible to upgrade? Uh, is it possible not to upgrade pack, one, one package in Conda? Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, we will see how to upgrade packages um, in the next session. So, first, we're going to cover how to install packages. And then once we have installed packages, we'll talk about what to do if you want to upgrade either all of the packages in a particular environment or just one or a few of the packages in a particular environment. So we'll cover that. I think we'll cover that question in the next section. Um, but if not, then the feel free to bring it up again and we can talk about, talk about it. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, then we will move, move right along to the next session. Okay, working with environments. So this section is going to be, um, very hands-on, um, certainly much more hands-on than the intro, which is very very wordy and lectury. Um, so in this section, we're gonna cover um, all of the basics um, of, of working with environments. We're gonna talk about you know, what is a Conda environment, talk about how to uh, create and delete environments, activate and deactivate environments. Uh, we'll, we will see how to install packages into existing environments and then talk about like the different places where you can create environments and kind of my recommendation and best practices for where you should create your environments. Um, and then we'll see some kind of uh, housekeeping commands in Conda about how to check what is actually installed in a particular environment and find where your environments live on your machine, like what environments have you already installed. And then we'll talk about, you know, when you don't need an environment, what you can do to delete it. Okay, so at this point, um, I am going to, I have my, I have the lecture notes up on a second screen. 
and I am going to shift over to Jupiter Lab and then shift back and forth. Okay, so this is the message that you will get if you have accidentally allowed your um, your Jupiter Lab instance to uh, to time out on you. It will say directory not found. So what you can do is then you can just uh, close this tab. And if you go back to the GitHub repo, you can open this environment in a new tab and then wait a little bit and it will be up and running again. And again, you can just hit cancel and ignore that. Okay, so I'm going to make this quite a bit bigger so that everyone can uh, uh, can see. So if you've not used Jupyter Lab before, um, that's okay. Uh, we're not going to be doing uh, coding in. Well, so I just back up. So Jupyter Lab is kind of the evolution of the Jupyter Notebook project, um, and is kind of a very common. Uh, development environment for Python, particularly within the data science machine learning uh, communities of the Python ecosystem. And but today we're going to use it as a um, as a, as a mechanism to get access to a terminal. So we're not going to be doing Jupyter notebooks um, or uh, IPython consoles too much. We're going to be working entirely within uh, within terminals. Um, over here on the left hand side, you'll see a uh, file browser and this, this is, um, you know, has some uh, uh, a readme file and then uh, just a couple of directories. One of these directories is introduction to Conda. So if you double click on this directory, then you'll see that um, it's, we've kind of navigated into the introduction to Conda directory and then at the top of this launcher here, it says introduction to Conda. So once you've done that, then if you, you click the little folder icon, it will kind of toggle the, um, the file menu kind of open and shut. And so I will move back and forward between this depending on how much space I want to work. So I will probably keep it mostly toggled off. So we have maximal space to work. Okay. Now, at this point, I will click on the terminal and when you click on the terminal, it launches a, a terminal, um, a bash shell terminal running inside of the compute environment where, uh, where JupyterLab is running. And this will be running in the cloud. So typically on Google Compute uh, Engine or possibly on um, resources contributed by other members of the, the Binder Hub Federation. Okay, so this is, um, primarily where we're going to be interacting with with Conda today. So I just want to make sure that we'll be able to read, uh, read my commands. So can everyone read this? So let's I'm just going to go to just check the chat. So if you could just make sure I want to make sure that the uh, the attendees are able to to read this, is the font size big enough? Otherwise, I'll, I'll try to make it a bit bigger. Okay, good, good, good. All right, I'm seeing yes, not seeing any no's. Okay, cool. All right, so good. A little bigger, there we go. Okay, I will try to make my window as, as big as possible so that we have plenty of of space, of space for typing. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of toggle back and forth between between this. So I've been talking about content environments, but I haven't actually defined what a uh, content environment, what a content environment is. So uh, a content environment is just going to turn out to be a directory. Um, it's going to be a directory that has a very specific structure to it, but at the end of the day, a Conda environment is just a directory that is going to contain the software 
that you have installed into that environment. So if you were working on one research project that requires a particular version of NumPy, say 1.18, and then of course all of the dependencies of NumPy, then that version of NumPy would be installed inside of a directory specific for that project. If you had another project that maybe was an older project that you started you know, a year ago or something and you were using Conda, and, or you're going back to it and you're gonna create a Conda environment for that project, if that project needed NumPy version 1.12, you could install that older version of, of NumPy inside of its own Conda environment, which would be in another directory. So it's basically, you're gonna have two different, you're gonna have different directories for your different Conda environments. And then once you have these different directories, then when you install packages or update packages, it's just changes inside of that particular directory. So there's not going to be any um, uh, connections between your projects. So changes in one directory are not going to impact changes or not going to impact your environments that are in other directories. Okay. Um, so there's a little call out box here that encourages you not to install packages into your base Conda environment. Um, so when you have Conda um, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, when you install Conda on your machine, Conda creates a base environment. And that's just Conda plus Python plus operating system specific dependencies. So you never install packages directly into that base environment. You will always, we will always be creating a new environments and installing into those new environments. And this is kind of a reminder not to do that. Okay, so let's actually, and let's get started actually creating an environment. So the first command that we're going to use for conda is the environment creation command. So that command is conda. So if you just type conda and then space and then dash dash help, then you will get the help menu for conda which explains the major conda commands. So the first one that we're going to talk about is conda create, which is a, um, the command for creating a new conda environment from a list of specified packages. And then we're gonna talk about many of these other commands um, over the course of, uh, of today. And then the, okay. So, um, this isn't a conda command, but a bash command that you can uh, use to clear out the, um, the, the terminal window is called clear. So if you type clear and hit enter, then that's just going to clear out the, the terminal window. So I'll be typing that command often um, to kind of just to clear out the terminal window. Okay. And then you can also press the up arrows to toggle back through your previous commands. That's also a, a handy uh, bash tip that I wanted to share. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to do con And then there's also a help menu for conda create. So if you, are un when, you're un when you're just getting started and you're unfamiliar with the syntax of these commands, you can often use the help menu to, out to figure out how to use them. So the conda create and the help command will bring up this menu and it explains you know, how to, it might look a little intimidating at first, but as you get used to reading these, you'll be able to find the information more quickly, um, but it explains the different options for the command. So we're going to be using the name option which is where you provide a name for the environment. Um, and then as we go through the day, we'll use other things like the prefix option and um, so other more advanced options. We will are a bit out of scope for, to, for the today's introduction tutorial. So we won't be using those, but if, as you get more um, experience using Conda, you may find yourself using some of these more advanced options. Okay. And so, and at the very bottom, there will always or there will typically be some example commands of how to how to use the command. So I'm going to type clear again to clear out the window. And now we'll actually use it. So conda create, 
and we're going to use the dash dash name option to give our environment a name. So it's always a good idea to use um, meaningful names, just like you would use meaningful names for your variables when you're writing Python code, you should use meaningful names for your environment. So for this first environment, we're just going to create a Python 3 environment. So I'll just call this Python 3. And I typically put a dash E and V at the end of my environment names, just to remind myself that it is an environment that I'm creating. And then we will install Python and then pip. So whenever I'm creating a new environment for a project, I almost, I always install Python and I always install pip. And then, then you can hit enter. <clears throat> now, so now the Conda tool is starting to work. And so the first thing that it's doing is it's looking for the list of things that we want to install. In this case, I asked for whoop, um, Python and pip. And so it runs out to the internet and collects information about Python and pip and then what dependencies are required for Python and pip. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then it figures out what is the most current set of versions for Python and pip and all of the dependencies for Python and pip that I can install in a way that will work so that there won't be any conflicting version uh, versions in the software. And Conda figures all of that out for you so that you don't have to bother with that. So that's what it means by solving. You see a, a line here, it says solving environment. So Conda is figuring out which package versions are mutually consistent with one another and then telling you these are the packages that I want to install. So there's a warning here about a newer version of Conda being a variable, um, we can just ignore that. Um, um, but note that it gives you the nice um, update command that you would need to run if you wanted to update uh, Conda. If you were running this locally, you would probably want to update your, your Conda version. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> Conda will provide a package uh, plan um, for you. So the first thing in the package plan, it tells you the environment location. So this is the absolute path from the root of the, your, com the computer's file system down to um, when we're running in the cloud, there is a directory called ENVS ENVS inside of uh, the Conda kind of mini Conda directory. Um, and then inside of that is a directory with the name that we provided here. And inside this directory is where all the software is going to be installed for this environment. <clears throat> so there is a question in the chat about a uh, comparison among Conda um, Brew and Mac OS, standalone Jupyter and RStudio. In my experience, Anaconda was somehow heavier. Um, so I am not going to compare um, Conda with, with Brew. Um, so Brew is an attempt to bring Linux-like um, operating system package managers like apt or yum, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which were um, to the Mac OS. So that's solving a much more generic problem than what Conda is solving. Um, but again, Brew um, specifically only works on Mac OS. So um, for the uh, narrower problem that we're interested in, which is primarily scientific computing, data science, machine learning workflows, Anaconda solves that problem, um, solves that problem in a more like lightweight way than I say Brew does, um, and solves it in a way that works across all operating systems. <clears throat> so that would be my comparison with with uh, Brew. And Conda is solving different problems than Jupyter and R Studio. So Jupyter and R Studio are um, are kind of user interfaces for uh, for Python or R respectively, um, and you can install Jupyter within your project's um, environment. And we'll see how to do that in a minute. 
And so Jupyter, like I have many different versions of Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab installed um, on my machine because I install them separately in each of my projects. Uh, but we'll also see um, in a later episode how I can, how you can use um, a kind of system version of Jupyter um, and link up different conda environments with that system version of Jupyter. So we'll, we'll, we'll see an example of that, but they're kind of solving different problems. So one is more the Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks and RStudio are kind of um, integrated development environments or user interfaces for Python or R. Conda is a tool for a lower level tool for managing, um, managing packages. And the second question, so NumPy, NumPy is not included in the base environment um with mini conda uh, we'll see how to install numpy in, in just a minute okay so all right going back to the uh package management plan so i'm, I'm walking through this in quite a lot of detail the first time because i want to explain to you kind of what's going on how it works but then we're i'm going to not go through this in this level of detail in future environments so we were talking about so this is the path to the environment, the directory where the software is installed. Then you get a list of all the packages that are going to actually be installed into that directory. So the, you can see that we asked for Python and we asked for pip, but we're actually getting you know, 20 other packages. And that's because Python and pip have their own dependencies that have to be installed in order for Python and pip to work. And so these are all of the the low level packages required for Python and pip to work on the operating system where we're installing the environment, which is Linux in this cloud environment in which we're working. Okay. Um, and you can see we didn't specify any Python versions or pip versions when our when we installed up here, we just said Python and pip. So what versions did we get? Well, we are going to get the most recent version of Python and pip that are mutually compatible with one another. So that means we're actually getting Python 3.9 and pip 20.2. We'll see in a moment how to specify different versions. Okay. Now, um, Conda environments have, they, it's kind of an interactive process. So it's never going to, it won't just install stuff without your kind of permission. So it kind of explains what it's going to do and then it asks you to proceed. And if you just type Y and hit enter, then the actual process of installation will, uh, will commence. And so here we're downloading uh, and extracting all the packages. And executing the transaction. And then now we're done. Okay, so now you have created your um, uh, you've created your own, your first con environment. So it's a very small con environment, but we've created it. Um, and then it tells you some commands about activating the environment and how to activate and deactivate the environment. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but it, they will always kind of be um, and, um, okay. So we've created our first environment. So I'm going to uh, clear now to reclaim the space. Um, and it's always, a, so it's always a good idea to, um, to uh, specify explicitly which versions that you want. So if you, if you don't specify, then you'll get the most recent mutually compatible versions. But so I just pressed up twice uh, in order to, talk, to go back to um, the environment creation command because we're going to run it again. So but let's suppose we wanted a particular version of, of, um, of Python. So in particular, let's suppose we wanted Python 3.6. So I'm going to give the environment a new name. I'm going to call it Python 3.6 env. And, and we were going to say, I want Python equals 3.6. So this is going to install, instead of Python 3.9, it's going to install an older version of Python. And then let's suppose that we want pip version 20.0 instead of 20.2 or something, which is the most recent version. Okay. And then we'll hit enter. So now again, Conda is going to go through the same process that I described earlier, 
But now you can see that we're going to get Python 3.6 and pip 20.0. So the, now we're getting the versions that we requested and we're getting a, different versions of the dependencies for Python and pip that are consistent with the versions of Python and pip that we requested. Okay, so now we can just hit yes again and we'll proceed. And so now it's going to install the, uh, the packages, the older versions of, um, of Python and pip that we asked for. And there we go. So now we've created a second environment that has um, a different version of, um, of Python, older version of Python. Now you might wonder like, well, what can I do if I don't know the versions? So I'm gonna clear this again. If I, what can I do if I don't know the versions of the software that I want to install? Well, so Conda has a search command um, that is discussed uh, here in the lecture notes. Um, so Conda has a search command that you can use to search for um, what versions of different packages are available. So for example, if you wanted to search for, uh, there's a question in the chat about NumPy. So you can just do Conda search NumPy. <clears throat> and um, Conda will go and find all the versions of NumPy that are available to be installed. And the search command, depending on um, you know, what packages you're looking for and how many versions of those packages are available, could take a little bit longer uh, to complete. But you can see here, so there are many, many versions of NumPy uh, available. And the, um, the output of this, let me scroll all the way up so you can see how many versions of, of NumPy are uh, are available. Da, 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 da. Many, many. Going back probably a few years of, of NumPy development. Okay. So when you scroll all the way to the top of the search results, you can see so the name on the left hand side. So that's the name of the package that we search for. So it's NumPy all the way down. Then you have the version number. So you can see the earliest version that is available is NumPy 1.7. And then there is, but and then it goes all the way down to the most recent version, which is 1.18 or 19, something like that. And then the third column is the build. And so that's what differentiates um, the, the uh, specific binaries for a package that might have the same version number, but might be built for different versions of Python or in the case of NumPy, different versions of the underlying linear algebra routines. So the oldest version is available is for Python 2.7 and for the basic linear algebra system, which is BLAST, built for OpenBLAST and then 201 is the build number for OpenBLAST. I don't know exactly what that, um, what that uh, entails for open blast but then so that but that's what differentiates and so then you can find for numpy 1.7 there's a python 3.4 build available for open blast and similarly and then if you go through and you scroll back down eventually you'll see that the python builds become newer versions of python and eventually python 2.7 builds i think will go away at some point python 2 support stop so i don't see any more python two builds in this list anywhere. Now we've got Python 3 and Python 3.7. Okay, so that's that's an example of, whoa, so many versions of NumPy. Um, you could run this command again for another package. So scikit-learn, just as an example. David. Yes. Uh, there, there is a question. Yes. Uh, is there a way to access the fix down in a particular package version or any additional in, info for package website? Um, okay, so the uh, when there's a new, so if there's like a bug fix on a particular package, 
then that package will be released with a new version number. So for example, on scikit-learn, let's start, so okay. So scikit-learn, the most recent um, minor version of scikit-learn is um, 0 0.23. But then there are many patch versions, so 0 0.23, 0 0.1, and 0.2. So whenever there is a, a new bug fix release, then there will be a new version number, a new patch will be released. And so then you'll go from 0 0.23.0, for example, for scikit-learn, to 0 0.23.1. And so once there is a, a new bug fix release, then you can download that new version of um, of that package. And if you wanted to find out exactly what the details of that bug, bug fix release were, then you would need to go to um, the, probably the GitHub uh, repository uh, for that source code. So for example, if you went to, um, you know, GitHub and scikit-learn, Learn, then um, there will probably be some like release tags. And for these individual release tags, then um, you'll typically have something like a change log. And then in the change log, it will explain um, the things that were fixed in that. Uh, in that new release. So in the most recent release of NumPy 0 0.23.2, there were some, uh, some fixes to uh, bugs in various packages, the scikit-learn cluster, decomposition, ensemble. So these were kind of some minor bug fixes. And I, this example was for scikit-learn, but other packages, NumPy, Pandas, um, uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, things like this, they'll be kind of similar. I would think. So that information will come from GitHub and then from the documentation for the individual packages. Does that answer the question? Rocco? Awesome. Okay, so we talked about Conda search. Okay, so we've done some basic things. So let's, uh, let's do um, a less uh, basic environment. So we're going to create now, um, uh, we'll call this the, a basic SciPy environment. And we're going to install uh, particular versions of the kind of core packages that you say might be used in, um, um, in a, SciPy, uh, a SciPy environment. And in the lecture notes, there's a particular set of version numbers. I'm going to leave the version numbers off so that we get the most recent versions of those packages, just because I'm curious as to how um, out of date the version numbers might be in my lecture notes, actually. So um, we'll install Python and pip, because I always install Python and pip. And then I want not just Python, I also want to have IPython, so I can do um, uh, have the nice interactivity that you get with the IPython terminal. So we'll install IPython. Um, I want to have some basic plotting. So we'll do Matt. Okay. So um, in Bash, there's a way that you can do multi-line commands by using a, uh, I never know if this is the forward slash or the backslash, but it's one that kind of starts at the top left and goes to the bottom right. Um, and I would like to have uh, mat plot lib for plotting. Um, and then we're going to install NumPy. And then we're going to install SciPy. So you basically, I'm listing these out with a space in between. And to try to make it more legible, I'm wrapping the command around multiple lines. Backslash. Thank you, Kuya. Um, okay, so now, now you can see that we have quite a long list of packages that are being installed. 
Um, you know, you can look through here and find all the ones that we specifically requested, like matplotlib, um, numpy, scipy ought to be down here somewhere. There's scipy. But there's loads of other stuff that has been installed as well. Also the same kind of version numbers. I did want to check the version numbers that we get. So let's see what we, we get. So the most recent version of Python that works with all of these packages is no longer Python 3.9. It's an older version of Python, Python 3.7. And we get numpy uh, dot, uh, one dot 19. Uh, let's see what version of IPython we, we get. So IPython 5.8, that is surprising. I would have thought we would have gotten a newer version of Python um, 1.8. And then what version of SciPy? do we get 1.5? Hmm. Let's see if we can get a newer version of, um, so I'm going to say no to not proceed. So you can always say, if you don't, if you're, if you want to do a different environment install, you can always just say no at that point, And then Conda will just exit without doing anything. So I'm going to clear. And we're going to go up and then we're going to, um, I apologize, this command has kind of wrapped oddly. There, wraps it a little better. So for IPython, I'm going to say, I'll put the version in my lecture notes and see if this works. And so we'll do this, the same thing again, but with the more, more recent version numbers. So I think 3.3 uh, was the most recent version of that. NumPy was 1.19, SciPy was 1.5. And we'll leave Conda to pick Python and pip for us. So this is an example of how I uh, might typically work where I will um, maybe st start installing by just listing out the packages without version numbers and see what version numbers I get. Um, and then once I see the version numbers that might be available, um, then I'll go back and maybe kind of put more restrictions on the versions that I, I might actually want. Um, and then so, okay, so here we go. So now it looks like I was able to get a more recent version of IPython. Um, yeah, so 7.13. So you can see it's listed there, but it will also be listed. Um, these are in alphabetical order here. Yeah, and we also got a newer version of Python, it looks like. Uh, Python, yeah, Python 3.8, okay. So let's say yes. So now we will say yes. And so now, um, now we're installing NumPy, Python, and Matplotlib, and kind of all of your uh, um, key scientific uh, Python packages. Okay, now I guess while this is loading, I'll, I'll mention, so um, uh, just so there, there's, there's no ambiguity. So obviously you need to have an, in order to use Conda, you need to have an internet connection because Conda needs to be able to go off to the internet and download the Python packages before it gets installed. But once the packages are installed, then obviously you can use them on your local machine without having an internet connection but you do need one while in order to install the environments uh, the first time. So now all of the, the packages have been installed. And so um, Conda then goes through and, and verifies them by basically checking that um, the 
packages have not been you know corrupted or that they match the um they match the the contents of the the packages match what is expected basically there's no no viruses or or crazy stuff like that in them. okay and now it's done so now now these packages have been uh, have been installed okay so at this point you know we've been going for a little bit longer than i um actually had intended before we were going to take a break so let's take a um um let's take a look at an exercise and we'll have a, a, a short break as well. So we'll take a, a five minute break um, and I'll, you can take a look at this exercise, uh, creating a new environment. So um, it's a machine learning environment. So machine-learning-m. So create environment with that name and then install um, you know, the packages that I have listed here. So IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, and, and scikit-learn. So I will I will stop sharing. Um, so we'll take a short break. Um, I'm just going to hang out here. I, know I won't won't talk or anything. Um, but I will take questions if, if people have questions. So it's more of a break for you as opposed to a uh, a break for me. And then have a look at that exercise. And um, I will also do the exercise. Um, and and then we'll resume in in five minutes.
OK, so we had a bit of a break there. And so now we're going to come back. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. Um, so I just want to go over the answers to that exercise. Um, so we're going to create a, um, a new environment called machine learning environment. And we wanted to add um, um, IPython. Um, and we'll put in version 7.13. And then uh, Matt Plotlib. And here I'm just using the backslash um, to list out the on list out the packages on separate separate lines just to try to make it a little bit more legible for for you guys but you could list these out separated by spaces all on the same line if you wanted so we're going to install pandas we're going to install pip we're going to install python and we're going to install scikit learn and then the last one we'll leave off a backslash so when we hit enter uh, Conda will will create the environment. One of the things that you'll uh, that you'll notice is that as you uh, list more and more, I'll just type yes and hit enter. So is that as you um, create environments with more packages, it's um, more difficult for uh, Conda to. It becomes increasingly difficult for Conda to, uh, or it takes longer for Conda to solve and find the most recent mutually consistent set of packages. Um, you can make it. Uh, there's a project called um, uh, called Mamba that is working to try to speed this process up, um, and then providing version numbers also speeds the process up. Okay, so now we've installed that environment. Um, so now let's talk about environment activation. So um, there's a command here that's conda activate, and then the name of the environment that you want to activate. Um, so environment activation is how you switch between all these different environments on that you might have on your on your computer. Um, and activation does two things. So one, it um, it adds entries to your system's path environment variable so that um, your computer knows to look in this particular directory for that environment to find software. Um, and then it might run uh, activation scripts. So scientific software typically sets a lot of environment variables. And the activation scripts um, will set those environment variables. Um, and thank you, uh, Genevieve, for providing the link to the, the, Mamba, uh, the Mamba project. So if we want to, um, just going to clear this, this out. If we want to activate an environment, we just use the name. So we do conda activate, and then the name of the environment you want to activate. So if we want to activate the base SciPy environment, we would just type the name of that environment that we created. And then we hit Enter. And that is interesting. Ah, I think I called it something else. So let's use the, the help menu here. So it says, run this command. So conda info. And let's see. Ah, so note I, I, I did a typo. So I wrote base SciPy environment, and the actual name of the environment is basic SciPy environment. So it was basically a typo on my part. But here you can see, so that this is this was a command that we haven't talked about yet that you can run. Uh, well, one of the commands that you can run to get the information about all the environments that you've uh, defined on your, your machine, and then the path the absolute path from the root of the file system to where that environment exists. So you can see there is this base environment, which we never install things into um, ourselves. That's managed by Conda. 
Um, and then we created this one, basic SciPy environment, the machine learning environment, Python 3 and Python 3.6. And then there's this environment, which has a star by it. And that's the actual note, the environment that is currently active, which is the notebook environment, which was created by Binder for us. Um, and that's what environment is being used to run JupyterLab and, um, and things. So let's fix that typo. So we're going to activate the basic SciPy environment. And now we can see that this environment is active because over here on the left-hand side, our prompt has changed. So in parentheses, we now have the name of the active environment. So that's how we know what environment is active. And now if we were to run things like which Python, which is a command in um, uh, hmm. is a command that, okay. So let's try a different command. So if you run the, uh, the Python command, then this will give you a Python uh, interpreter, but this Python interpreter is the Python that is running inside the uh, basic SciPy environment. So we should be able to do things like import NumPy as np. Um, mm -hmm. That is bizarre. Unexpected. Okay, so let us deactivate the environment. So this conda, there is a conda deactivate command, which does the opposite of activate. So it deactivates your current environment and takes you back to the default environment, which in this case was notebook. So now if we run uh, which Python? Hmm. Something. Something has gone a bit screwy here because it should, the Python that we should be using is the Python that is in the notebook environment not the Python that is installed in the base environment. Hmm. That is fine. So let's try to activate the machine learning environment. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm trying to activate a different environment. And now if we do, uh, let's try IPython. So you've installed IPython in that environment. Okay, so there we go. So that gives us IPython. And now if we do import NumPy as MP, okay, so there we go. So now we've got um, um, NumPy and in our machine learning environment, we should also be able to import um, things like scikit from scikit-learn. So, um, from sklearn import uh, cluster, for example. Okay. Okay, so this seems to be working as, as expected. I'm not quite sure why the basic SciPy environment was misbehaving. So let's quit. Um, okay. So, but the, the, the purpose of this was to show you the um, activation and the deactivation commands. Okay. Um, 
Right. So we did activation, we did deactivation, and I actually just did these two exercises uh, for you. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of skip those. Okay, so let's do uh, installing into an existing environment. Okay, so we've seen how to create environments. And so, but what if you want to install a package into an existing environment? So that's uh, another command. So that's the conda install command. So here we have an active environment, the machine learning environment. And let's suppose that we want to install um, uh, Numba. So let's look at Numba. So Numba, if you're unfamiliar with the Numba, Numba project, it's a, a project that does just-in-time compilation for uh, Python and primarily NumPy code and targets um, not just specific CPU hardware, but also targets um, GPUs. So it's a way that you can kind of take a Python function, as the example shows here, this is just a um, complete, just vanilla Python function, and just in time compiles it so that it will run um, basically as fast as performant C or Fortran code um, without you having to rewrite your code. You just add these little uh, JIT decorators. So it's a really cool um, package to be aware of. And we want to install it into our machine learning environment. So how does this work? Well, there's a conda install command. We can look at the help menu for that. Um, lots of more advanced things. But what basically what you can do is um, if you want to um, you can just do conda install and then the name of the package that you want to install. You can also use the command to install it into an environment by name um, or an environment by what's called prefix, which is providing the path to the directory in which that environment lives. OK, so I'm going to clear this out. And so we're going to install into the active environment, which we made the machine learning environment. So we're going to install Numba. So now Conda is going to run off and figure out basically what is the most recent version of Numba that can be installed into the active environment. And so it finds Numba 0.51.2 or Python 3.8. Just go ahead and say yes and hit enter. And so now it's going to download and install a number. Okay. So that's an example of how to install a package into an existing environment. Um, and now there are a couple of exercises. So I'd like you to take uh, five minutes and have a look at th these exercises. Um, where, where are they? Here they are. Um, so there's one to install Dask um, into the machine learning environment, and another one to install um, a package using pip um, into the, also into the machine learning environment. So you're gonna, there's a link to Dask and a link to Combo. So if you could just try to install those two packages into your machine learning environment, then I will be right back and then we'll go through the answers to those exercises together. Okay, so I'll set the timer so you can take five minutes and have a look at those exercises and then I will be, uh, I'll be right back.
Okay. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so what we wanted to do was uh, install Dask. Um, so Dask is another one of these uh, you know, great data science machine learning projects that uh, should be aware of. So Dask is basically a tool for scaling um, the standard kind of NumPy, Pandas, scikit-learn stack um, both up in terms of taking it, uh, well, more scaling it out across um, uh, across multiple nodes in a computing cluster. So scikit-learn on its own is able to scale uh, up vertically on a single node and take advantage of all the cores that might be available on a single node or a single machine. Um, NumPy basically, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, Dask provides a way to scale the stack uh, across multiple machines um, in a computing cluster um, with relatively little changes to uh, to code. So it's a good package to be aware of and know how to install. So if we want to install um, uh, Dask into the active environment, we can just do conda install Dask. Okay, and you can see that Dask has you know a fair dependencies. So we'll just hit yes. And then so that's that's that done. And then the um, the next exercise was to install using pip. And so if your pip is the kind of the default um, Python uh, package manager um, that's used kind of in the entire Python ecosystem, but it, it, it plays very nicely with, uh, uh, with Conda and support for the more advanced features of, of pip um, kind of increases with each new Conda release. So there is a, um, just as a motivating example, there was this interesting package called combo, um, which is a package for doing what's called ensemble learning and machine learning. So it basically is a package that allows you to aggregate predictions across multiple models and then kind of either average them or take a majority vote or do a max uh, maximization um, to get a final prediction. And it's an example of a, um, a package that is available via uh, pip and the Python package index, but it's not available via conda, or at least it was not at last I, I checked. Um, so, but because we installed pip into the machine learning environment, we can do uh, a pip install uh, combo. And hmm. and now Pip is installing um, some dependencies that it need, or Combo is installing. Let's see, there is. Okay, there we go. And so now uh, Pip has installed uh, Combo. Okay. Okay. So that is an example of, of how you can use Pip to uh, install into the uh, into the current environment. Although I'm a little bit worried, so I'm surprised that there's something that is a bit um, unusual about this compute instance that I'm running. So it seems that um, 
pip installed a bunch of dependencies that we had already installed. So for example, pandas, um, numpy, number, um, matplotlib, scikit-learn. So these things were already installed in our environment. So pip should not have downloaded them. So um, one way that uh, another way that you can install via pip is to um, use a particular version of Python, the version of Python that is installed in your uh, active environment to install uh, via pip. So if this is an alternative syntax for installing via pip. And so it's already been satisfied. Hmm. But this is installed combo in the wrong place. So it's using, hmm. Okay, so the, there's something that's happening at least on my, uh, on my instance and binder, which should not be happening. And that is when you type which Python, oops, which Python, this should point to the Python that is inside your active environment. And this is not, this is pointing to the Python that is the base version of Python, basically. This is not the right Python. Why it's doing that, I don't know. I have not experienced this when using Binder before. Um, but it seems this is not the correct behavior. This should be returning the Python that is in um, that is in the machine learning environment. So, in particular, if I was to do uh, which IPython, so this is returning the correct answer. So notice that um, um, it's returning the correct IPython um, because this is an IPython that is installed within the bin directory, which is within the machine learning environment. So that is what I was expecting uh, Python. Um, so Genevieve is saying, well, can you try relaunching the terminal? So that is true. So I could do a, let's try that, um, a new terminal. And now um, I can do, if I do conda info EMVS, I can try to activate uh, machine learning environment. Okay. And now, which Python? Hmm. So you can look on Linux, you can look at your uh, path variable. Yeah, so this is the problem. And this is a bug. This must be a recently introduced bug into Binder that I will need to report. So this, so notice in the path variable here. So the path variable controls the order and where the the order in which the computer should look in directories for software that you want to install. Um, and you can see that in the path, this directory here is listed before this directory. So this this directory, which is our active environment, should be listed first. And the uh, but because first, um, you're always going to find basically the Python and pip that are installed within this directory, which is not good, and that is why when we did um, when we write which Python, you get the Python that is in this directory here. 
Similarly, if we were to do which pip, we get the pip that is installed in the, the base environment, which is again, not good because then if you do like what we did pip uh, install um, combo. So let's look at the output of this. So we had the machine learning environment was the active environment. We ran pip install combo. And look, if you look at here, what happened? So um, combo is already found, but it's been installed in our base environment, which is not good. And then also pip went and installed numpy, um, or scipy, numpy, matplotlib, all of those seem to be installed in the base environment, which is again, uh, not, uh, not good. So this is a bug on binder, which I need to, uh, which I need to report, I think. I think it's a bug on binder, on the, the binder environment. I will have to, to notify them and try to, uh, try to see. Okay, anyway. Um, so hopefully that was interest, an interesting kind of digression. It wasn't part of the plan tutorial, but it did hopefully explain a few things about how um, different versions of Python and PIP install things in different locations. So hopefully that was an interesting learning experience. Um, uh, so yes, so there is a nice comment from uh, Umberto that said we could explicitly point to the Python that we wanted to. So for example, um, so let's do uh, conda um, info ems. So we could do um, conda machine learning environment bin Python and now we're there's no way for me to make this all fit nicely on uh, on one line so Python so we use this version of the Python so we're going to pass the absolute path to the Python binary that we want to use to get around any ambiguity about which Python we should use and then we'll use pip to install combo All right, now let's look at this. Um, now this, this worked exactly as expected. So because we were using the uh, Python version, a very specific Python version, um, we made sure we were using the Python version from the machine learning module to, to install pip or to install combo using pip. Now you can see that it found matplotlib, it found numpy, it found numba, it found joblib, it found scipy, scikit-learn, and all of these dependencies of combo were already found in the environment because we had already installed them. And then at the end, it downloaded stats models, which wasn't already installed in the environment and maybe a few other packages. And then it actually installed these packages here. So just combo and the other ones that have been installed. Um, okay, so again, I'll, I will open a ticket after this with uh, the binder team to try to find out exactly why that path variable is being, um, is not behaving as, as expected. Okay. So I'll clear this out. And um, Kristen, can you tell me how much um, how much time do we have left? So an hour and a half. And is that a hard stop in an, in an hour and a half or? Let's see. I want to make sure Pulling up the calendar. Yes, yeah, so it's an hour and a half, and there is. Um, there's an hour break afterwards. So if you go over it, that would be okay. If it's okay with everybody I else. I, um, I, I've tried to, I just, I'll try to, I went in promptly, uh, but I just wanted to see 
if that was like you know an hour and a half of teaching time and then there was some time for q a or if um that's fine so we'll, we'll try to go for another hour and 15 minutes or so and then allow um allow time for questions at the end okay so that's the, the but the the stop it will be at um let's see five six thirty my time so an hour and a half from now yeah okay cool um okay so we'll pick back up so we're going a bit slower than i had uh i had anticipated because of a technical difficulty uh with the path variable not working properly so i'm going to try to try to pick up the pace a little bit because i do want to make sure that we cover um the rest of this episode but then definitely the the episode on on sharing environments okay so let's talk about where um so where condit environments live so we've, we've actually already seen this so we can go over it um, um relatively no, we should go over it, it uh it pretty quickly so the conda uh, info command gives us the location so this is uh called the prefix for each python environment so we um which is basically the path from the root of the file system to the particular Python environment. And then you will see the active one is a star. Okay. Um, now, if you install locally, then instead of slash SRV slash conda, this would be mini conda three or mini conda um, on your local machine. Okay. Um, so let's see how we how we can create um, an environment um, in a different location. So instead of defining our environments in a, a um, defining our environments in the default location, let's see how we can change. So I'm going to deactivate the uh, machine learning environment, and let's see where we are. So I'm in the home directory. So I'm going to change directories into introduction to conda directory. And now I'm going to uh, make a project directory. So I'll just call this um, my project. So I always create, you know, every project gets its own directory. And then I will change directories into my project directory. Okay. Now, when I'm inside my project directory, I like to create a conda I like to create my conda environments inside of my project directory in a subdirectory. So I can do this by um, running the following command. So I can do the, um, so conda create prefix. So instead of name, now I'm using a prefix. And for the prefix, you can just pass in the, the path. So you can, it can basically be the absolute or relative path from the current directory, which in this case is um, introduction to conda, my project directory, to the directory in which you would like to create the conda environment. So I will use, um, you know, you could use the, uh, PWD environment variable to which will give you the path to the current working directory um, slash env. So that's the name of the directory in which I want to create the content environment. Or you could also use a relative path by just hitting dot. It's up to you. And then we can list the, um, the packages that we want to install. So install. Um, Python, uh, pip, mypython, no, just pandas, and matplotlib. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so these are all of the, the packages that are going to be installed. There's nothing new there. Um, so we'll just go ahead and install them. And then the point of this was to show you actually where, um, where this directory will, will, uh, will be created. Okay, so notice that now at the end, instead of giving you the name to activate, it says conda activate and then the name of the path. Um, so, but we can actually just pass in uh, the relative path. So you can actually do conda activate env. Um, make this a little longer. Um, and activate. Okay. And now the prompt is getting uh, getting very long. Um, there is a. Um, I'll talk about how to shorten that in a minute. But um, so what you can see now is that the active environment is now showing instead of a name it's basically showing the path to the environment um but now we've created this emv directory so if we were to look in the my project directory then we have this emv directory and then you can see you know this is the the directory that contains all the the, the packages and you can see it has you know quite a a lot in there but it's a very specific structure on how conda uh, environments should look and where things should be stored. The details of this are well beyond this, uh, this training, uh, but you can just see that it's there. Um, I really like creating my conda environments inside of a, um, an EMV or an env directory in my projects because it helps keep my software stack and my project all in one place. Um, also, the, the env directory is um, generally going to be automatically ignored if you're using version control with Git. Uh, and the standard python.git ignore file will ignore an env directory. Um, and so that way you, you don't have to worry about um, inadvertently version controlling your environment, which environments could be quite big, like depending on a, on a large project with lots of dependencies, there could be gigabytes of information in this environment directory. Okay. Um, So now uh, there's another exercise that I want you want you to take a look at, um, and that is so try this creating environment as a subdirectory within a project directory. Um, so try to go through what I just did on your own and see if you can create an environment for um, Python three six um, and TensorFlow two dot one and these other things. So see if you can create that environment. I'll set uh, you know, maybe three minutes to have a look at that exercise. Oops. Um, yeah, okay. So I'll stop sharing for a minute and give you guys an opportunity to, uh, to look at that exercise.
Okay. So hopefully that gave you a, a chance to, to have a look at that exercise. So I'll not go over the, uh, the, the solution to the exercise is there. So I won't go over it in the interest of time. So I wanted to show you. So while you guys were doing the exercise, I um, ran a, uh, I ran a command, make it so that it fits all on one, uh, on one line for you. Um, so in the, in the lecture notes, uh, there is a, a kind of a hint on how to shorten your prompt. So if you're bothered by this, this, you know, just growing out slightly out of control prompt, um, you can, um, of course there are ways with bash that you can configure this prompt here to make it shorter if you, uh, if you want to. Um, but if you don't want to have the full path show up over here and you would prefer this to be, you know, just something uh, kind of show the generic name instead of the, uh, the path, then you can run this command, the conda config command, with, which allows you to configure conda's behavior at a lower level. Um, there's some links to the documentation on that in the lecture notes, but if you run this command, it will, um, basically make changes, it will either create or it will make changes to a file, a configuration file for conda that lives in your home directory called .conda rc. So if we were just to look at this uh, directory or look, look at this file rather, we can see that it has set this variable to have this value, which is just basically a way to get it to just display a generic name so for, um, um, for environments with names, this will just display the name, of the, the name of the environment. But for environments that are created with a prefix that don't have a name, it will just take the directory name as the generic name. So that's a way to kind of hack your prompt to be a little shorter. OK. Um, so let's do conda, let's deactivate this environment. Um, and so there's a, another command besides uh, the, uh, the conda info. So now I want to talk about you know, where can we list existing environments. So there's another command besides the conda info command. There's also a conda list command which, um, whoop, sorry, that was the, got a little bit of ahead of myself. That was the next command. There's a conda environment list command, which will give you the same information as the conda info command, kind of a, a list of the, the current environments that you've created. Notice that, sorry, that now we're seeing this, this environment that we created by prefix now shows the path to the environment directory, but then just kind of a blank for the name. If you want to list the contents of a, um, a currently active of the current the pro, the package is installed in the currently active environment, first you need to activate the environment. So let's activate the machine learning environment, and then if you do conda list. then you will see all of the packages that have been installed in the current environment. So if you want to know what's installed in your environment, you can use the, uh, the conda list command to do that. Um, and if you don't want, if you want to list the contents of a particular environment without activating it, then you can do um, conda list and then provide either a name or a prefix depending. Uh, so let's, if we did basic, SciPy environment, then this would list the, the packages installed in the basic SciPy environment. So notice that, so SciPy is installed, but scikit-learn is not, for example, because we didn't install scikit-learn in that environment. Okay. 
Okay, um, so deleting Conda environment. So that's the next one. So if you don't have a need for an environment, you can delete it. So let's do Conda info. Uh, so let's delete this um, Python 3.6 environment. So if we do Conda uh, remove, and then the name of the environment that we want to remove, I'll put this on multiple lines now. Uh, so we want to remove the Python 3.6 environment. And then um, if we want to remove the entire environment, we need to do conda remove and then name of the environment and then dash dash all so that it removes the entire environment, including the, you know, all of the packages and then the directory itself. So it will always prompt you um, to make sure that you are, you know, doing what you want to do. So you say yes. And now um, if we do uh, the environments, we list the environments, you can see that now the environment Python 3.6 is gone. So we still have Python 3, but no longer Python 3.6. Okay. So we had lots of twists and turns in this episode, but we've now kind of covered uh, covered everything in this episode. Um, and so now we'll we'll move on. But we covered the create and remove commands, the activate and the deactivate commands, and showed you examples of how to install with conda install into a particular environment, um, and how to use um, pip to install into an existing environment. Um, and that helped us discover a bug uh, or what appears to be a bug um, in the, at least in the Binder Hub instance that I'm using. Um, and then the, um, we talked about how to list the list, both the environments that you have installed and also the contents of those environments. Okay. So any questions before we move on to And sharing environments and environment files and things like that. Stop sharing briefly so I can see the chat better. Okay, and so no questions. We will move right along to sharing environments. Let me share my screen again. Okay, so sharing environments. So I'm gonna very briefly talk about um, why you should share your environments, your con environments with others. Um, and then we'll talk about the mechanics of how you actually uh, share those environments. Um, and in particular, we're gonna talk about environment files. Okay, so um, environment files are going to be how uh, the mechanism within Conda with which you can most easily share your environment um, with, uh, with others. So with your environment um, file, so an environment file is uh, written using a particular uh, text format called YAML. Um, it, YAML is very popular for uh, writing configuration files for um, all kinds of applications from like simple web apps up to Kubernetes clusters. And it's been adopted by uh, Conda as kind of the specification file format for, for writing Conda environment files. Um, it's very common in the Python community, I guess, in particular, because YAML has, um, it's designed to be human readable. It uses Python style uh, indentation um, to indicate nesting. So it's, it's very kind of familiar, has a familiar look and feel to it if you're a Python programmer. So here's an example of what an environment file looks like. So, so for the machine learning environment that we created, it would look something like this. So we just have an environment.yep file that has um, a name, a key name, and then the name of the environment, a key dependencies, and then a list of uh, the dependencies that we wish to install. Now, if you're going to install and not by name, but by prefix, then this environment file would look slightly differently. 
So instead of a, the name machine learning environment, we could have just the name, we could be null, so we could put null as the name, but environment files must have a name as the first line. That's kind of a sanity check. You can also specify uh, explicit version numbers for packages. Uh, so I typically, in my environment files, I will typically specify um, explicit version numbers for all the packages that I want to install. Um, I mentioned earlier about never version controlling the environment directory. Um, if you create uh, your um, content environment as a prefix inside your project directories, you will always version control your environment.yaml files. That way you have a, a kind of complete record of all the changes to your environment uh, over time. Okay, so let's let's create um, let's create uh, an environment using an environment.yaml file. So the first thing that I'm going to do is let's clear. Um, I'm going to change directories to the parent directory, which is introduction to Conda. So we've got the my project directory. So let's do. Um, Uh, make a new project directory. So my other project directory, and we will cd into that directory. And now we will create um, uh, a new text file. And we will rename this as uh, environment.yaml. Oh. So if you right, I should have, I went a little bit quickly here, but if you right click on the file name, you'll get a little menu that has things like rename in it and you can correctly spell your environment.yaml. Um, note, JupyterLab supports syntax highlighting for multiple programming languages and text file formats. And so it, it does, once you put the, a file as a dot, it understands this is going to be a YAML file. And so now we can, um, I'll just copy and paste actually. Uh, let's copy and paste this one. Uh, right. So we can just copy and paste the environment uh, file. And now uh, there's a slightly, the command to create an environment from an environment file is slightly different. It uses the um, conda emv sub command. We can look at the help menu for the sub command and it has create, uh, remove, similar commands to the conda uh, main command itself. Um, but now these are the command, the sub command that you use if you want to work with um, environment files. Okay, so we've created an environment file and we've, we're in the project directory. And if we run the ls, the list command in bash, uh, you can see here's our environment.yaml file. So now we're going to run, and this is like the one command that I run all the time because I always create my content environments from environment.yaml files. So this is this is the command that I run, um, and I always create my uh, content environments inside a directory, inside the env directory. Um, gosh, this is getting just. A little smaller so that things kind of fit on one line. Um, and then you pass in the name of the file, environment.yaml. Okay, and then hit enter. And at this point, the con is doing the exact same thing as if you had you know, kind of manually typed in the conda create with a prefix and then listed out the packages that you want to install. The, the difference is that instead of listing it out, you basically put it into this YAML file. 
And this is a much more kind of robust way to create environments. And then it also gives you this file, which you can pass to your research colleagues. And you know, if they're running Windows or Mac, then they can use the same environment file to create the same environment um, on their operating system. Just gonna wait just for a minute for this to, uh, for this to finish. And notice one thing that's different about creating from environment files is that uh, you don't get kind of an interactive prompt to say yes or no, do you want to uh, create, um, or do you want to create the environment or not? Just straight away it goes into creating the environment. Okay, and then you know once the environment is created, of course we can activate it. And so now we've activated uh, um, and then you know if we wanted to look at which I Python, yeah, we can see that we're using the expected version of I Python. But then if we do which Python, yeah, we're still getting this one, which is not right. Okay. Okay, so that's creating uh, an environment from an environment.yaml file. So you can create an environment.yaml file uh, from an existing environment. So if you didn't create your environment to start with from an environment.yaml file, you can extract one. Um, using this um, environment export command. So there's a couple of things that you have to be, be wary of um, though when you use this environment um, export command. So for example, if I, so let's do uh, deactivate the environment and then let's just make this Let's uh, activate the machine learning. We didn't the, uh, the machine learning environment from an environment.yaml file. So we don't actually have an environment.yaml file uh, for this. But if we use the conda uh, export command, uh, oh, so conda, sorry, conda environment export command this will create an environment file. So it's, you can see that, right. So, okay, so this is a valid environment file. And, you know, you could copy and paste that if you wanted, but a better way um, would be to redirect the output into a file. So we could call this, um, Exported uh, environment.yaml, environment.yaml. Now, if we just looked at it in the browser, so we would have, so now we've created this environment file from an environment for which we didn't um, have one. But this is super specific. If you compare the environment files, it has you know, both like the name of a package plus a particular version number plus a particular build number. Now, this is great if you want to have an environment file to share with other people who are using the same operating system. Um, but it won't. Uh, work if you're trying to share environments across operating systems. So like Windows or Mac and between Windows, Mac and Linux, because these build numbers correspond to operating the system specific uh, builds of the various packages. So if you want to get, and that's what this, um, this beware conda EMV export command is trying to get you to, uh, to be aware of, is that if you want, there is a, 
um, a oops a flag called no builds which will oops um, which will I over accidentally overwrote that um, file, but now this is the same file, but now it doesn't have the build numbers. But it still is going to have packages that are operating system specific occasionally. And so even this is not a guaranteed way to generate an environment.yaml file that will work across all platforms. So that's why I tend to always create my environments from an environment.yaml file that I make myself. And as, when you specify just these kind of high level dependencies that you need, and then you let Conda um, find the dependencies of these main dependencies, then this environment file could be used to create the same Conda environment, but it would work on Windows, Mac, or Linux. So, you know, get in the habit of creating environment files from scratch for all of your new projects. And that will be the way to maximize the um, reproducibility and portability of your environments. All right, let me just check chat because there's a, a question. Tetsuo uh, Koyama, so can an environment.yaml file reference the requirements.txt file? Great question. The answer is yes. Um, so this actually is a little bit more advanced than I was of a question that I was planning to cover, um, but it's a good digression. So let's um, let's do that. So let's suppose that we wanted to install. Right. Okay. So there's a couple of ways. So let's suppose we want to install Combo. So Combo is that package that we installed via pip earlier. So let's suppose we wanted to install that here. So one way to do it would be that we can add. So once we've added uh, pip, we can the list where we would install uh, Combo like this. Um, and uh, and so we could list basically pip dependencies here inside the environment.yaml file. So there's some examples of that in the, um, uh, in particular in the NVIDIA um, GPU dependencies um, episode, which I'm not sure we're gonna, we're gonna make it to today. Uh, we'll see. Um, but what you could also do is, you know, if you're used to working with pip, then you're used to working with uh, requirements dot, uh, dot text files. So let's create um, a new text file and we'll call this uh, requirements dot text. And now with a pip requirement dot text file, you would typically just list the dependencies you wanted to install via pip. So let's list combo here. Um, now, in our environment file, instead of explicitly listing the pip dependencies, you can list um, uh, you can list things that will be passed to the pip install command. So, in particular, there's a when you pass uh, there's an option a dash r option to the pip install command, where you can install from a file. Uh, and then you can say requirements.txt. Now, when you run this, it will install all of the dependencies, including pip via conda. And then it will run a pip install to install the pip requirements from the requirements.txt file, which whatever you have listed here. <clears throat> and this requirements.txt file can be whatever you, um, however you're used to writing your requirements out text files. You can put all the same things here and it, it will work. Um, so now if we wanted to install this, 
Um, let's do, I'm going to deactivate. Um, I need to be, where did I create my other project directory? Okay, so now if we run the, just going up to find that kind of create command. And now we need to add the, at the dash dash force options because the environment already exists. If we leave that out, it will say, well, this, this directory already exists and it won't allow you to kind of overwrite that directory, blow away that directory. Um, so if we add the dash dash force option, Now this will install from that environments file, but then it will also use pip to install from the core MS.txt file. So that's a good, uh, a good question. And um, in fact, this is how I structure all of my, um, all of my conda environments. So I have my environments YAML file where I have my conda requirement or my conda dependencies, and then a, a requirements um, .txt file where I install all my pip things, things that are only available with pip, and then I link the two together using this uh, uh, this trick in the environment uh, .yaml file. And I'll just kind of walk you through this and show you kind of how um, how this goes. Right. <clears throat> okay. And so you can see, so after um, after it installed via conda, then you see that it ran. So use the absolute path to the version of the Python within the, um, the content environment that you were creating, and then use that to run pip. So that makes sure that pip installs in the correct location. Um, <clears throat> and then it passed the dash R and then this option, or the, then the path to the requirements.txt file. So then it kind of worked as expected. Okay. So good, uh, good question. Okay, so I want you to get some practice <clears throat> um, creating the um, an environment from an environment.yaml file. Um, so let's take uh, three minutes and try to create an environment um, for XGBoost. So XGBoost is a really popular um, a machine learning library for uh, doing gradient boosted trees. Uh, it's super efficient. Um, GPU accelerated, uh, if you have a GPU, uh, wins a lot of capital competition. So why don't you um, take a few minutes and try to create an environment from an environment.yaml file. And I've kind of given you the environment.yaml file. So basically you just need to, you need to practice the, um, the command, basically. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. And I'll set a timer. And yeah, so let's just take a few minutes and uh, have a look at that.
I'll be right back. Okay, so I have started uh, that episode or that exercise as well. Um, so mm -hmm. just kind of wait until that finishes. So I kind of copied over the environment.yaml file, I created a new directory, and then I uh, created the environment file in the directory, and then I ran the command to create uh, from an environment.yaml file. OK. So updating an environment. So there was a question about, uh, about how to update environments. So now we're going to provide an answer to that question. Um, so. If you want to update an environment.yaml file, the, the way that I would recommend that you do it now that we've talked, or sorry, the way that you would update a package in an environment, um, uh, now that we've talked about environment.yaml files, the way I do it is I just add or remove packages from the environment.yaml file. Um, so for example, we'll just do this exercise with Dask. So if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to add Dask to the environment, I would just go in here and add Dask, and then save the environment file. And then I could just rerun the environment file command, but um, there are actually, so there's two commands that you can use. So there is an actual update command, this one. Um, but I actually prefer just to rebuild the whole environment from scratch myself. So that way I only have this kind of one key command that I use for all of my Conda environments. So. You can do it either way, um, but if you kind of do it the way that I would, I I do it personally, then you only have one one real key command for kind of creation environment creation to keep track of. So now this is going to rebuild the environment entirely from scratch, except this time it's going to also install Dask.
Okay, so while that is finishing, I'll talk about um, how to make your Jupyter aware of your Conda environments. So in our, let's go back to our launcher. Um, so in our, uh, in our launcher, so these notebooks, um, these notebooks are linked to the underlying environment in which JupyterLab is running. So in that case, this, in this case, it's the Conda notebook environment that was created by Binder. So if we wanted to create, um, if we wanted to launch notebooks or IPython consoles based on an environment that we've already created, another Conda environment, we have to link that Conda environment with Jupyter. And so here I've given basically the commands that you need to, uh, to run to do that. So um, in particular, you have to install this um, IPy kernel package inside of your environment. Um, so let's, uh, so let's see if this is finished. Okay. So the Dask environment has, um, so just to make things a little quicker, I'm going to not, um, kind of, I'm going to activate this environment and then I'm going to do, uh, kind of install IPy uh, kernel. And just going to install the IPy kernel directly into this um, rather than rebuild the environment in the interest of time. But I'll remember to go back and add here uh, IPy kernel. Uh, to my environment file so that that way later when I do rebuild from the file, I will make, be sure to get the IPy kernel. So I say yes. Okay, so now that I, the IPy kernel uh, has been installed and the environment is active, um, we can copy this command here which is going to use the Python um, from our environment. Uh, normally, we could just hit enter and this command would run, but I'm a bit suspicious because of the, of the issue that we were having earlier that we, we were going to need to actually provide um, the full path to the environment Python. Um, so this, this is basically the PWD will take us to our project directory. And then we need to go to the inside that, to the environment, to bin and then Python to make sure that we're using the right Python. Again, normally you don't have to do this. Once the environment is active, you can just use Python. Um, but I'm a bit worried that it's not going to work properly. Okay. So once we run this command, it creates something called a kernel spec and a kernel spec basically is how Jupyter understands how to um, link uh, virtual environments like Conda environments and, um, um, and Jupyter kernels, which are what are used to launch notebooks and things. So now if we go back to our launcher, and sometimes you need to click this refresh button uh, a few times. But then eventually we should get a second notebook icon show up here and a second IPython console icon show up there. There we go. And so now we have a notebook and an IPython console that are linked to our XGBoost uh, environment. So then if we were to open this notebook, for example, we should be able to import um, XGBoost as XGB and then hit shift enter to evaluate the notebook cell. And there we go. So now we've installed um, XGBoost. Or we've, we've installed uh, an XGBoost environment 
we've then used that uh, IPy kernel package and the kernel to create a kernel spec which linked that Conda environment with uh, Jupyter notebooks and IPython consoles running inside an existing Jupyter lab. So this is really handy when you're running, um, you know, in this case, we're in a cloud environment where we don't necessarily control the Jupyter um, notebook environment directly. It was built for us by, by Binder. Um, but now we can create our Conda environments and then link the Conda environments to notebooks inside that Jupyter lab. This is also useful if you, your company or your, um, your university has Jupyter Hub. Um, and so you can get access to Jupyter Hub, but then you can use uh, this idea to link notebooks and consoles to, um, to that Jupyter lab running on that Jupyter Hub. Okay. Uh, there's an exercise here for another practice creating a custom kernel. So I'll leave that as an exercise. Uh, um, well, actually, let's take a few minutes and, and, and have you take a look at that exercise. Um, so I'll set a timer for three minutes and see if you can see if you can create your own custom kernel for the machine learning environment. Um, and don't forget that you'll have to install the IPy kernel package inside the machine learning environment before you can create the kernel. Um, we didn't do that. Okay, so I set three minutes on the timer um, and I'll be, uh, I will stop sharing and I'll be uh, right back. Okay, we're back. So any questions about that, uh, that episode before we, uh, before we move on to kind of the last topic that, uh, that I want to cover? No, okay. Okay. 
Uh, so the next episode is on using packages and channels. So I'm just going to quickly move through this and then we'll focus on uh, what remaining time we have um, with the GPU uh, dependencies. So uh, talk about what are conda channels and what are conda packages. So, um, so just briefly, so conda, conda packages are compressed tarball files. So they contain, they have a certain, the tarball file itself has a certain structure and that structure kind of maps onto um, the contents of the, the environment directory that we looked at earlier. Um, so there's great documentation from the official docs on, on this that kind of explain the details, but that's um, what I want you to know is that um, conda packages are tarball files that have a certain structure. The more important thing are conda channels. So conda channels are basically where conda will look to find conda packages to install and then in what order or what priority the channels will have with respect to one another. Um, so there's a couple ways that you can install from channels. Um, so you can specify particular channels when you do the conda um, uh, install command. Um, or in your environment.yaml file, you can specify uh, channels as part of the environment.yaml file. And we'll see some examples of that in the next episode with GPUs. Um, so I'm not um, And then we'll also see uh, channel priority examples. The order in which you list your channel is, is important because it determines the priority in which Conda should look for packages if it finds them in multiple places. So for example, if you're, if you're installing a package from the, with the conda install command, priority decreases from left to right. So the highest priority channel here would be bioconda and the next highest priority would be conda forge. Um, so conda forge is a, the most popular channel. Um, it can, it's the largest kind of community channel um, and it has loads and loads and loads of stuff. So I always look on Conda Forge um, to see if my package is available via Conda Forge. If you're doing bioinformatics, Bioconda is a great channel for bioinformatics software. Uh, so, why the, so there's a question from Jamie uh, about why the need for priority. So the reason is that uh, packages might exist on multiple channels. So packages with the same version that you want might exist in multiple channels. So you need to provide priority, the channels need to have particular priority so that conduct can deconflict which version, which package it should install if it finds the same package version in multiple places. So that's the need for the priority. Um, So here's a, another, oh, actually, here's an example of installing pip within environment.yaml files. We did that one earlier, actually. Um, and then the rest of these details, I think, are a bit too specific for. So let's just hop to the next, uh, the, the next episode, uh, which is on GPU dependencies, and we'll finish out there. OK. So um, managing GPU dependencies. So I mentioned at the very beginning that you know, data science, machine learning are rapidly moving to, to GPUs, not just for, for deep learning with libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow, which have been GPU accelerated for quite a while. A lot of the what I'll call classic machine learning pipelines um, and are, that we would normally do with scikit-learn are being accelerated with uh, GPUs on NVIDIA's Rapids uh, open source stack. And then even things like SQL queries um, have been accelerated on GPUs with tools like uh, Blazing SQL and things. Um, so GPUs and managing GPU software is um, a key part of doing data science and machine learning. And Conda is, um, is incredibly useful for that. So here we'll see how that all works. Um, But before, before I dive into this and then just kind of push through for the rest of, uh, let's take a short, uh, just a short break um, for five minutes 
and then we'll dive into the last uh, this last episode and then finish out the, the tutorial, the training. Okay, so we'll take a five minute break. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so installing CUDA libraries with Kana. So the major CUDA library that you need to be familiar with uh, is the NVIDIA CUDA, uh, CUDA toolkit. So let's go ahead and see what versions of CUDA toolkit are available with Conda. So we can do Conda search uh, CUDA toolkit. And we can see the versions of CUDA toolkit that will be um, available on the 
the main Conda channels. What? Hmm. Hmm. That is I spell CUDA toolkit wrong? I did. Hey, silly me. It's too early in the morning here. Uh, right, okay. So if you do a search for CUDA toolkit, you'll see that there are many versions of CUDA available. We have uh, all Toolkit 9, so Toolkit 11 is the most recent version. Most of the deep learning libraries are on, uh, I think PyTorch is, and NVIDIA Rapids might be available on 11, but most everyone is on CUDA 10.1, CUDA 10.2 for sure. Um, so there are CUDA Toolkit uh, packages available, so that's good. Um, the other libraries that you're going to need are um, uh, QDNN. So if you're doing um, uh, deep learning, so QDNN is some um, uh, GPU accelerated kernels specifically for doing uh, deep neural networks. And so there's lots of versions of uh, QDNN available. Um, notice that the CUDA, QDNN versions have uh, specific builds corresponding to specific versions of the CUDA toolkit. So that's important. You have to match the versions of these kind of secondary CUDA libraries with the underlying CUDA toolkit version. Um, but Conda will handle all that for you. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, another one, if you're doing multiple G GPUs, is called Nickel. And so Nickel is also available. Um, and, and again, the um, different versions of Nickel will these different bills will correspond to different CUDA toolkit versions um, that you require. And Conda will take care of managing all of that, uh, all of that for you as well. So CUDA libraries are definitely available via Conda. So that's what this is covering here. So we did CUDA, uh, the cool toolkit, QDNN, uh, Nickel. Um, and now, so we have some examples. So the rest of this, uh, this episode is mostly about um, examples. So, um, so we have an example with PyTorch uh, and then an example, an exercise that you can work through on your own for, uh, for TensorFlow. Um, so again, if I was going to create an environment for PyTorch, then note, oh, see, notice here, so here's an example of an environment.yaml file that has channels. And so you just list the channels in the same way that you list dependencies. And the order in terms of channel priority is the highest priority channels at the top and the lowest is at the bottom. Um, and with PyTorch, this is particularly important because the official PyTorch builds are released via the PyTorch channel. Um, and however, community members have put their own builds of PyTorch on Conda Forge. So you don't want to get um, a, a an unofficial build of PyTorch from Conda Forge, you always want to get from uh, the PyTorch official channel. So if we were to go to the PyTorch, uh, the PyTorch website, and uh, da -da -da, installing. So uh, Conda is the preferred mechanism for installing. So here I'm running locally on Mac, and there aren't Mac CUDA binaries for PyTorch. Um, but if you're running on uh, Linux, for example, 
you could install Conda and you can pick your version of uh, CUDA that you want. Um, and here they specify specifically using the PyTorch channel. Um, but you can do all of that in an environment.yaml file. Whoop, sorry. Um, so let's see, see how to do this. So if, again, if I went and let's create a new directory, and I'll call this um, my PyTorch project. And inside my PyTorch project, I create a new text file, which I will call environment.yaml. And then I paste the contents of my environment.yaml file into the text, uh, into the text file. And now we can create, let's see where I am. So I need to change into my PyTorch project. So there's the environment file. And then we just use the conda environment. Prefix uh, environment.yaml and then hit enter. And so you can see here we're installing the CUDA toolkit. <clears throat> and then there's PyTorch. And then the rest of the, the dependencies will follow. Um, one thing to note is that um, with, in Binder, there aren't GP resources are not attached to this compute instance that's running in Binder. So you wouldn't actually be able to use the GPU accelerated version of, of PyTorch within Binder. Um, but the same approach would work on, on other, hard, other Linux systems where you do have actual GPUs, in which case then you could use the GPU uh, acceleration. So it, it's hard for me to kind of, um, overestimate the, the contribution of Conda to simplifying uh, installation of uh, data science and machine learning software stacks that require GPUs. Because before Conda, you had to manually install everything um, from directly from NVIDIA, which is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And then a lot of the different frameworks for doing deep learning or doing GPU accelerated uh, machine learning require different versions of CUDA. Um, and then you'd be, you'd have to, you know, uninstall or reinstall different versions of CUDA on your system. And that was just a pain. It was really difficult to manage. So Conda has, has dramatically simplified this, this process. Okay. Um, so I'll wait until that uh, PyTorch environment is done. I'll go back and check on it in a minute. Um, there's an example environment here for TensorFlow. Um, so you can see it's basically the same, the same idea uh, with TensorFlow. Um, but TensorFlow is available via the standard channels. It doesn't have its own uh, channel. So there's no like TensorFlow channel. It's just the standard channels. Um, then there's another example here for uh, NVIDIA Rapids. Uh, NVIDIA Rapids is a, another project that you, you should be aware of um, for doing kind of GPU acceleration of what I would call classic machine learning uh, pipelines. Uh, you can scale uh, Rapids up in terms of taking advantage of multiple GPUs on the same 
node in a computing cluster. It also scales out via Dask to multiple GPUs on multiple multiple nodes in a cluster. Um, so it's a, a really powerful library for doing GPU accelerated um, machine learning. And the preferred method of installation for getting started is, in fact, Conda. Um, and then there's a blazing SQL, which I mentioned earlier, which has um, uh, GPU accelerated uh, SQL querying. So there's an example here for that. Um, let's go back and see if, yeah, okay, so this is, this is done. So then if we were to activate the environment, so conda activate the environment, and then we ran conda list just to see what was installed. And you will see if you, so here's CUDA toolkit. And actually PyTorch is, works with CUDNN and Nickel as well, but PyTorch, the PyTorch binary itself is statically compiled and linked against CUDNN and Nickel. So you will get those speed ups without having to actually install CUDNN and Nickel separately, which is um, you know, a simplification put together by the PyTorch team. Okay. So the last thing that I want to just kind of discuss, the last example that I want to discuss is, um, so all of the previous that you, uh, you just need to use pre-compiled binaries and that you don't need to, um, you don't need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler or NBCC. You may find that you in fact do need the NVIDIA CUDA compiler for your project, in which case you need to use a different uh, package from Conda. You need to use the CUDA toolkit dev package. And this, uh, this package will download a development version of the CUDA toolkit, which will include the NVIDIA uh, CUDA compiler. So for example, if we go in here and we were to say which uh, NVCC, then nothing is returned. So we do not have the, the CUDA compiler um, in this case. So we would need to install um, the CUDA toolkit dev package in order to get access to the compiler. You might need to do this. Um, there are some libraries, uh, PyTorch cluster, PyTorch geometric that used to um, not distribute their compiled binaries uh, via Conda that you had to uh, install them uh, via pip, in which case, you, in order to compile custom CUDA extensions, you needed access to the, uh, the NVCC. And so here's an example of an environment.yaml file that specifies both a uh, dev version of the CUDA toolkit and also a package that will get you uh, C and C++ compilers that will work with NVCC. So it's more of an advanced uh, example, but I just wanted to make you aware that this is possible to do with Conda. Um, and a working example, should you um, want to go through it um, um, on your own when you have access to a machine that has a GPU so that you could actually test that this, this does work kind of as advertised. Whereas I can't test it here, unfortunately, because we don't have access to a piece of GPU hardware. Um, and I think at this point, so there is a more, there is one more kind of very advanced example. Um, if you're interested in building uh, an environment for a large scale, uh, for doing large scale distributed deep learning using a tool called Horvod. Uh, which is a framework that had been open sourced by Uber um, a few years ago for scaling, um, efficiently scaling uh, deep learning with TensorFlow, PyTorch, or Apache MXNet. Um, and in order to uh, in order to build the CUDA extensions for Horovod for those frameworks, um, you need the compiler. And so this shows you an alternative way to get the um, to build this environment with Conda that assumes you've installed um, CUDA yourself 
uh, locally. So I think rather than try to rush through any of those those examples, I'll just kind of you know again make you aware that they're here in the uh, in the training materials for you to go over. And you know we've got about ten minutes left, so I'll go ahead and stop here. And then if you guys have uh, questions, um, I'd be happy to take them. Um, if not, then thank you very much for uh, spending this time with me this morning. I've been very excited to participate in uh, SciPy Japan this year. And uh, I'm sorry that we weren't able to do it in person. That would have been very fun, but you know, 2020, what a year. And um, well, again, yeah, so if you don't have any questions and thank you very much for, uh, for taking this time to spend with me today. I very appreciate it. You're most welcome. I hope you, uh, I hope you got something out of the training. Um, Condo has been a game changer for me. Um, it has, um, I don't have issues with software installation or conflicting dependencies or environment management anymore. Um, Conda has completely solved those problems for me. And um, I hope now that I've given you kind of an introduction, you'll have enough to go off and learn how to solve those uh, problems for yourself. So Genevieve has a question about making Python packages. I'm still confused about the packages Conda installable. So um, yes, definitely outside the scope of today's training, uh, but there is a tool called Conda Build. I will put the link. Um, let me dig out the link here um, to the Conda Build tool. It's a separate tool that you install um, that allows you to um, create Conda uh, packages. For, uh, for distribution. Another resource to be aware of is, um, so Conda Forge. And the reason is that, so not only is Conda Forge channel, but it's like an ecosystem of, of Conda package distribution. So I'll put the link to Conda Forge as well in the chat. So with Conda Forge, um, they have automated the process of creating Conda packages for existing packages on PyPI. So if you want to um, create a, uh, a Conda distribution for a, a package that you've already made available for installation via PIP on PyPI, then that process is entirely automated. And you can uh, go through the documentation on Conda Forge to understand how to do that. But it's a very straightforward process that can be completely automated. Um, and yes, many, many, many thanks to our interpreters um, for providing the simultaneous interpretation uh, of today's talk in Japanese. It's always great to try to expand the, uh, the audience for these talks as much as possible. So thank you very much to um, our interpreters today. Any more questions? Okay, it doesn't. Koyama-san, are there any more um, any more questions that you're aware of? Ah, so, so sorry. It is it is uh, thanks to the translator. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Just checking. Just checking. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of SciPy Japan. Um, Kristen, that's that's me done. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, Kristen. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.